I don't have one. Yes, ma'am. So I hear what you're saying about statistics. Yep. Where are these statistics coming from? How can I research them? What is the poll? I really want to see the numbers. Yeah. Because I study statistics yep. and I understand how they can be manipulated. Yep. I'm going to tell you out here, my experience is not what you're saying with the children, <clears throat> which terrifies me even more. And I want to have hope and I want to have faith. Yep. And obviously, that's what I'm fighting for, right? Yep. And I want to inspire and I want to make that change. But what I'm hearing from you is not the reality that I'm facing right now, currently. So I'm in the school systems. I'm yep. talking to the students. I'm literally talking to the parents. Yep. And it is terrifying what is coming out. Um, I wish I could agree with you and just be 100%. So I just, I need to get this, I need to yeah. research what you're saying. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So all the polls that I'm telling you, you can find at conventionofstates.com. Click on the press icon. And then what you want to do, if you really want to dig into it, is that's gonna bring up like a summary press release. And then in there, you're gonna see a link to the Trafalgar full report. And you click on that and then you can look at all those cross tabs. And the way the polls are done so that you know, cause I think how you ask the question really matters. You can kind of manipulate polls if you ask the question in a way that is leading to an answer. Trafalgar won't do that because they worry about their national reputation. But you could judge for yourself because you can look at those questions yourself. And then if you look at the poll, what you're going to want to do in the full report is scroll all the way to the bottom. And that's where you'll see all the cross tabs. Now, here's what I'll tell you about Trafalgar. 2016, 2018, 2020, 2021, the most accurate pollster in America. The only guy that predicted Trump's victory, DeSantis's victory before anybody else. He got Youngkin right in Virginia. And so this is a guy that's very accurate in his polling. The way the polling works, just to give you a little bit more detail without going into too much and boring everybody because you're the data geek, uh, is that he pulls a sample of a minimum of 1,000 people. The average national poll is 500. He doesn't believe that's a big enough sample to get an accurate poll. Now, 1,000 sounds like a small amount. And what he does is if he feels like he's getting a weird result, he'll do that two or three times to make sure he's getting a consistent result with different samples. But that's how the polling's done. All the data is there, all the methodology is there, so you could take a look at that yourself. And one of the things I think we need to be really careful about, remember how I said when you look at your own period in history through your own eyes, you only see what's right in front of you, and so you're, not get, you're getting this amplified effect of whatever you're looking at, like that's what's going on because that's what I'm looking at. That's evidence that's anecdotal evidence and the way you get beyond anecdotal evidence is to go broader into the data so i could tell you almost the opposite thing which is i spend a lot of time with kids that are so good that it's like there's no problem in america you know the kids that are my interns at cos they graduated from hillsdale uh, they graduated from Liberty University. They're the conservative kids we gather from campuses all over the country. So my experience with young people today is like, oh, why well, do I have to worry? These kids are all awesome. And that's why I have to go broader in the data to look, because that's just what I live in every day. We got to look at a broader data set than just what we experience every day. And by the way, it's going to vary from culture to culture, city to city, school system to school system. You know, if you come to Texas and you're in Austin, you're gonna meet a lot of kids that probably have the same value sets that you're seeing, right? But if you move one county outside of Austin, where I live in Williamson, the kids are exactly the opposite. These are well church kids, they grew up in great families, they have values that you and I would recognize. So we always have to be really careful about looking at what's in, right in front of us and generalizing from that. All right, the next question is from Cynthia. Hey, Cynthia. Um, I run uh, Moms for Liberty. Group. Yes, I love you. And, uh, I love Moms for Liberty. Gays against group. Uh, gays against group. Yep, I love that group too. Great group. So, uh, what I want to say that's really different um, is that the pedagogy inside the the schools is so different than it was in the '60s and the '70s. Absolutely. We still had some positivity and yep. some love of America. These kids um, that are starting in kindergarten. Uh, they're being taught that America is toxic, yep. that love of America is toxic. Yep. And so when you go outside of the schools, you, you get those negative answers. Yep. So, so we're dealing with, with, with a beast here. Because, Agreed. You know, they, they put 200 Marxist professors, tenured them, and then they grew from there. Right. So we have a different environment. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So 
Like, I mean, to go even further back, this comes from uh, Gramsci is where this is Marxism a la Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci was an Italian Marxist, a fascist. Uh, they should have killed him as part of the, I mean, sound, that sounds really radical, but they put him in prison. Uh, and when they put him in prison, he actually wrote notebooks from prison where he lays out, you guys have heard of the long march through the institutions. So the, the, what the Marxists did, and this is Gramsci, they were really frustrated because they couldn't figure out why Marxism wasn't just working. What most people don't know about Marx is Marx was not proposing a system of government or even a system for society. Marx said Marxism is just inevitable. It's just going to happen. This is the natural progression of society. So he never had a plan for how to make it happen in society. Gramsci, many years later, becomes frustrated because Marxism hasn't been widely adopted. And he decides that taking the entire culture is what you have to do. And so he coins the term the long march through the institutions. In other words, we got to take over the schools. we got to take over the arts. we got to take over all the cultural institutions. And we got to put people in there who believe the way we believe. He influences something called the Frankfurt School out of Germany. A lot of wealthy people send from America send their kids over to Germany. They get educated this in this because they think Germany is so efficient and operates so well as an industrial machine. And then they bring this philosophy back to the United States and it makes its way through our institutions. And what we're seeing now is, I, I would argue, is the tail end of that. And this is one reason I'm a little bit hopeful, Cynthia, maybe more hopeful than you are. I think one of the reasons the leftists are so wild in this country right now is because they understand that they're at the end of the march through the institutions. So the 60s radicals were really where it starts to hit its stride and they start to get all these professors that come out of there. Those are the people running our universities today, the radicals of the 1960s. Right. And so that's Bill Clinton is the first president to come out of that era. Obama is a follow on from that. Uh, Biden comes out of that era. But they're all starting to age out. And one of the things that you see is when the beast is dying, it gets a little wild, right? It's going crazy and it lashes out. And I think that's where we're at. It doesn't solve the problem. The, the pedagogy inside the universities, inside all the way down to kindergarten is bad and rotten. I'm not sure we can fix our schools. And so I'm of a split mind about this. If you have to have your kids in the schools, then my argument would be, you damn well better be in the schools warring on behalf of your kids. My kids came through public school, yeah. My kids came through public schools and they were okay because they had a good foundation and we were in there all the time. And we were going to war and we were fighting over curriculum. And so even when the curriculum was bad, the, the principal knew and the teachers knew the Mecklers were going to be in there and we were going to raise hell, right? And my son, who's really smart at a real young age, he was going to raise hell. And we taught our kids to raise hell in school. We taught them, if you're right, be polite and raise hell. Like, don't, don't put up with the stuff that they're saying. Anti-American stuff, you say no, right? And so you can be inside the schools and fighting for the schools. Uh, I, you know, I heard today or yesterday, I didn't realize this, you guys don't elect your school boards, right? Man, that's a really bad thing. So I don't know how to fix that. I need to talk to you all about that. In the states, which is, I, I've never heard of a state where you don't elect school boards. And in most of the states were fighting for the school boards. And so a lot of people are running for school board. Who appoints the school boards? <laughs> Jeez. Oh, what a mess. Uh, I'll come back and we'll talk about that. <laughs> well, I'm gonna have an idea what to do. Uh, but we gotta fight for the schools. And I think one of the biggest ways we can fight for the schools, just to be blunt, is just to be a royal pain in the backside, right? So, you know, when the teachers, when the curriculum is bad, when the teachers are teaching this anti-American garbage, when they're teaching this sexual garbage, then we as parents and grandparents and even people who are just citizens with no kids in school have an obligation to go in there and protect the kids, right? I mean, who are we if we won't protect our kids? And so I think we have an obligation to do that and to fight for that. And then I would say this, if you can, if you have kids, get them the hell out of those places, right? That would be my first choice. And I have people tell me all the time, look, it's really hard, I work, we don't make enough money to put them in private school. I get all that, I really do. And I don't mean to minimize the burden of doing that. But the question that I always ask parents who say that is, 
what is it not worth doing for your kids? Right? Is there something you can tell me? I wouldn't do that for my kids because it's too hard. And the, every parent pretty much says, well, there's nothing. I'm like, well, then get your kids the hell out of those schools. And so we're going to, I think we're going to have to break that system and crush it to rebuild it. One of the things I'd be in favor of at the level of the federal government, and I think we could do this uh, with the Convention of States, is I, I don't think they should be able to have these untaxed huge endowments. I mean, let's tax those endowments at 90% or something. Let's take their power away. So I agree with you, it's a serious problem. Convention of States isn't necessarily the fix for that problem, that's a cultural fix. Hi Mark, uh, thank you so much for your talk today. I just wanted to make a comment because I know that I have this fear and I kind of share this fear with a lot of people my age too. Yep. And that's that it's not even the government that we have to fight anymore but the people who run the government, which is the people with money, like right. the banks. Yep. So even if we were to fight the government, the people with money have so much power that it wouldn't even really make a difference. So I guess it's like, how? what can we do to fight those people? And how do we know that like the Convention of States can take the power back from both the government, the people with money, and give it back to the people down here? Okay, so I want to make a distinction here. I mean, first of all, as long as there have been people, there have been powerful people with money, right? So, and this is really important, powerful people with money is not a problem per se. It's power, powerful people with money that do bad things with that money. And also, it's this weird uh, joining of forces between companies and the government. This is super unhealthy and it was not intended to be this way. You know, so we've got this corporate oligarchy essentially in our country right now. I honestly never thought I'd see this because I, you know, I remember when I was your age and I was growing up, it'd be like, well, the left hates the big corporations and conservatives were like good with it because it's business. And now it's actually become the opposite, right? Because why? Because the big corporations are now in bed with the government and enforcing what the government wants. So the answer to it is really the marketplace which is the patriot economy. And this is what I call it. It is rising and it is part of the great decoupling. If I could today, uh, I would stop doing business with every company that does political things that I don't like. That's not practical in America right now. You know, if you want to bank, good luck finding banks that bank the way you would want a company to operate. Our job is to exercise our consumer power to the extent we can. And this patriot economy is rising right now. I'll give you an example. So our company, our organization banks with Chase Bank. I don't trust Chase Bank. I don't like Chase Bank. I don't want to be with Chase Bank. And so I've been hunting for banks that I could use for Convention of States. And we're now in the process of moving banks. There's a bank out of the Southwest called SunWest Bank. The main owner is a guy by the name of Eric Hovde. Eric is a conservative politician from Wisconsin. I know him personally. It's a great high-tech bank. There's no way this bank's ever going woke. So we do millions of dollars of business a year through our bank. We're gonna pull our business and we're gonna move it to a bank that's conservative. And what I really want out of industry is I don't even necessarily want them to be conservative. Just leave us the hell alone, right? Just get out of politics. Make a good soda, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't really care about your politics. I don't want to know about your politics. I don't want your politics imposed on me. As conservatives, we have not been good at imposing pain on corporations that go woke, and we have to get better at that. How do you know if a bank's going woke? All you have to do is li literally research any bank and see if they're doing ESG, which is this environmental social governance, right? And they have this thing that they call a stakeholder, right? So it used to be, that a corporation's only obligation was to maximize profits for its shareholder. That was literally a legal obligation. It's a fiduciary duty. Now what they say is there are other stakeholders in a corporation. This is an absurd legal fiction. And in my opinion, it's a breach of their fiduciary duty. They're saying, oh, well, if we have a bank and the bank's in Honolulu, then we have an obligation to the citizens of Honolulu. No, that's not true. They have an obligation to their shareholders. They have no obligation to the community. They might want to do charity in the community and that's fine, but that's not an obligation. And so what we need to do is push back against all this ESG stuff. That's a big place that it starts. 
And there are rating organizations online you can go look at. You can look up any company and see if they're doing all this crazy ESG stuff. And we have to push back against it. I want to give you one great example of it who I support very strongly because of what they're doing. <clears throat> and that's Daily Wire. And I don't know how many of you are subscribers to Daily Wire. Like, even if you don't listen to Daily Wire, you should be a subscriber. What Ben Shapiro and Jeremy Boring and the guys at Daily Wire are doing is they are the point of the spear in the culture wars. And as soon as they started doing it, I became a subscriber and I pay my money to them gladly every month. Anybody see the Jeremy's Razors commercial? Do you guys know what that is? Yeah. There's a few. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to tell you, this is the greatest commercial ever made in the history of television. <laughs> had the audacity to say something incredibly outrageous on the air one day. He said, men are men and women are women and one can't be the other. And somebody on Twitter freaked out on this and complained to Harry's Razors and Harry pulled all their advertising from Daily Wire. And Daily Wire said, look, it's a free country, pull all your advertising if you want. But Harry's Razors spoke out against Daily Wire and said, you know, these guys, who are, they don't share our values and they're bad people. And, and so what they decided to do was launch their own razor company. And so instead of, instead of Harry's razors, you have Jeremy's razors, <laughs> right? And I love that these guys are media guys. What are they doing launching a razor company? But trust me, when you see the commercial, you're gonna understand what they're doing. And so they launched this razor company and in three days, they have 80,000 plus Razor subscriptions. <laughs> that division of the company is now $150 million in value. That one division of the company, at two days after they launched the Razors, across from the Harry's Razors office in New York City, <laughs> they put giant billboards that say, I hate Harry's.com. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And I know Jeremy, and so I wrote to Jeremy when that happened, and I said, Jeremy, I signed up. I'm so proud to be a subscriber. In fact, you're welcome to charge me three times as much, and you don't even have to send me a razor. <laughs> right? Because the deal is we've got to support companies that are willing to do this. They're going to have a whole line of uh, consumer products coming out of the Daily Wire. I'm going to buy all of them. I'll be honest with you. I mean, this is just a serious fact. I don't like the razor as much. I'm being honest with you. I've told them that. Like, you guys need to improve your razors. They're not as good. I shaved with it this morning. I don't love it. I'll keep shaving with it, <laughs> right? Because I'm going to be a Patriot consumer, and I, I don't care if I like Harry's razors better. I'm not giving those guys a damn cent of my money when there's an alternative. So that's how we fix that problem. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of the question and answer period, and uh, I'd like to ask Brett and Cheryl to come forward. We'd like to present Mark with uh, a little memento. Oh, for you guys are too good to me. Here today, uh, and really this week, in fact. Uh, and in fact, we were hoping that Mark's wife would join him, and unfortunately she had to uh, stay at home the last minute. Cool. Love that. Street.